Adams State College, great stories begin here. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's ASC faculty lecture. Tonight is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. We have Dr. Comfort Cover from the Business Department. She's in Management Information Systems, so business computing is her field. And tonight, she's going to be telling us everything we need to know about the internet. So right now, please join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Comfort Cover. So let's first off start with how did I get the name Comfort Cover? And you know, let's let's take care of that first off because everybody always wants to know. Um, it's like okay, what where did that come from? I'm the youngest of four girls. I was supposed to be a boy, and my mother had picked up only boys' names. So why she was asleep after I was born? My father and my grandmother named me after my mother, so my name is Comfort Fakeover. My mother's name is Comfort Fakeover, but they assumed that all women will get married and change their name. I didn't, and my husband's over here. I just <laughs> didn't change my name. So <laughs> that's how I ended up with that name with no junior. So there are actually two comfort covers in the world, and my mother does make quilts. So <laughs> it's like, okay, Mom, just don't start selling them, and we'll, we'll be okay. So what do you really need to know about the internet? How do you build a web page? How do you deal with the stuff that's on the internet? How do we do this? So tonight I'm going to tell you about a little history. What the World Wide Web is not the internet. Why I say that, don't confuse the two. How do you connect? How do you protect yourself? Different browsers, surfing, and a website. Do I need one? If I can say yes to that, what am I going to put on it? And what do I do with it? So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So let's start strictly with a little history. How many of you know where the World Wide Web and the Internet started? It's a Cold War. It's a product of the Cold War. Um, the military and the research scientists of the world were having issues, guns backfiring and blowing up in the military spaces. Needed to get some scientists working on that project and helped to make that stop happening, and they needed different people from out throughout the world. So they started to build a very small network. And you know how Al Gore always says he started the internet? No, he really didn't start the internet, but he is one person in our political world that has promoted it, supported it more than any other political person. So that's why you get that impression that he started it. He didn't, but it started out at ARPNET. ARPANET was started in 1969. I think I was, uh, uh, how old? <clears throat> we won't go there. <laughs> Fairly young. And it was to do it and connect four computers together at remote locations, one at UC, UCLA, one at Stanford, one at Santa Barbara, and one in Utah. That was it. All they wanted to do was get those four computers talking. So they started, and here's what they started with. This was their first drawing. It was ARPNET, December 1969. It's four nodes. And Charlie Klein of UCLA sent the first packet of internet traffic across the network and tried to connect to Stanford on October 29, 1969. He got to the G of login, and it died. It's like, okay, <laughs> we'll stop there then, all right. So that's where we started to what you know today is changing. So in 1988, I started using the, the internet in 1992. Colorado Springs had a little dial-up modem. It was fun, wasn't it? <laughs> so way back then, there was hardly anybody who knew about it. There was no World Wide Web. There was none of those things. And the first worm hit the network, which would mean to you guys the first virus, a Trojan horse, hit the internet. And immediately then, if you can imagine, remember where it started. It was a military, secret things, needed universities to help with research, brought all these people together to do that, and now somebody has broke in. Immediately, they had to sever all of the lines to the military. Any installation to the military got severed. 
So now set this network with these feelers out that were connected to nothing. And all of a sudden, those of us in higher ed said, what do we do? How do we reconnect? We need to be connected together as research scientists. So they bit the dust. And in 1989, you notice we were commercialized. And MCI came in. And other commercialization happened. So now you have this block. How many of you know academia real well? Tonight, how much did we charge you? Yep. Oh, yeah. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> how much did we charge you? So we want to give it away, right? That's our point. We're learning. We get grants from the government. We want to give the knowledge back, and that's our job. Now you put us in with commercial. And you've got the two bloods mixing together and us saying, no, we're giving it away. And them saying, no, we're giving you how much money? You got you to gotta, you gotta up. We got to sell something. What are you going to do? And we go, no, yes, no, yes. And we fought for many years, till about 96 or so. We won because the World Wide Web didn't exist. So the rest of the world never really cared. So academia won. And it was strictly for those of us who wanted to talk research, this and that, and you could go out and use a big, huge library. So in 1989, we commercialized the entire internet. And at that moment, the world changed. And we get this today. So those four computers has turned to this. This is only North America. This is not the world. And all it represents is all of the servers and network connections for the internet today. So we went from four to this. Now, if you think back, the internet originally when it started, there was no World Wide Web, but I used it. So that's why I say the World Wide Web is not the internet. They are not synonymous terms at all. They are not. The World Wide Web is a network of fibers and wires and things, or the internet is, that makes everything flow across this line. So let's stop and talk about how do I connect. How does a telephone company connect? You pick up the phone. Do you have to wait for AT&T or Ma Bell back then to exist on the other end to make the line call go through? No, you just picked up the phone and dialed. If you had a dial tone, you could dial, right? Same thing with a network connection. If I plug it in and the computer hears a dial tone, it's online. <coughs> it, it, there's no, okay, I got to bring up the web and I'm going to bring up the internet. No. As soon as you plug in to that network, you are on that network. Everybody gets to see you. So at that moment, if you plug in, you're on, the world, you're on the World Wide Web, you're on the internet, you're on everything. You're connected to this network. So here's how we connect. This entire circle. Now, don't let it confuse you. The first thing you have to remember is here's your computer. It's got what we call a NIC in it. Because you can't talk to a network unless you have a network interface card. That's why we all call them NICs, because it makes it shorter, it's easier. So you know someone's a geek if they say NIC. They're talking about a network card in their computer that I plug into the, just like you had to have a handset to plug into the wall. I have to have a network card to plug my computer into the wall, because I have to get to that line, that fiber. Yes, sir. Dial-up would be obsolete. Yeah, but what, there's a huge problem with dial-up. Because if you're like me, I live out in the country. I don't have a phone. I don't have cable. The only way I can get internet, and I, I, trust me, I don't live without the internet, is through a satellite dish. So broadband is, should be where we're going, but we're not. So whether I have 
a network and I'm connecting through a modem that's a dial-up, meaning it's going to pick up the phone line and use the phone line and dial a number and connect at the other end. Versus it's a dedicated line that's coming in, it's always on, and it's right there for me. Okay, it's always on. That's the key, always on. It's never off then, it's always on. So here, regardless of how I have the internet coming to me, whether it's via a phone line or a cable line or the satellite dish, it doesn't matter. It has to connect to that modem. The modem then goes into my computer. The word modem stands for what? Does anybody know? Yeah. Modulator, demodulator. Yep, modulate, demodulate. I want to bring in the signal, modulate it for what I need it, use it. Now I got to send it out. I got to demodulate it for the rest of the world to go across that wire. That's all it's doing. No matter how you connect to any network, you have to set that component in the middle. I got to modulate and demodulate every time. So I have my modem sitting there. Then there's this stuff that says router and local internet provider. That segment right there is the company that you call downtown. For me, it's Wild Blue. That's my internet service provider. Some people talk with Verizon. Some people use AT&T. Some people use AmigoNet. Some people use whomever it is. That becomes this router and this local internet provider. What's a router do? It routes your data. That's it. Don't let the words scare you. It routes the data. So I have a modem that's modulating, demodulating, picked up by the router, the data packet, routed to where it needs to go. Out it goes. And when it routes it, it routes it out to this guy, out to the backbone, all the way over to some other computer. Across that huge spider web, whatever packet of data I sent out will go there, hit this backbone, and then here. And let's talk for just a second. When I say backbone, when you pick up the phone and you're going to call my sister in Wurzburg, Germany. Okay. How many different providers are you going to go through to get to Wurzburg, Germany? I'm going to jump through how many, get on some big trunk line all the way under the ocean, up through the fork, British, that, into Germany, and then I get my sister. It's one continuous check connection, but it's got all kinds of hops, right? So. If you take that, this is working exactly the same way. When we talk about the backbone, that's the connection that's up high where I'm really moving data. And I'm going, okay, that computer's in Wurzburg, Germany. Whee! We gotta get this stuff over there quickly. Let's take this route. So there's many little routers sitting out there grabbing data packets and shuffling them down the line in the right directions. So on a phone system, those are those switches boxes that you guys see. They're switches that sit on the side of the road and there's a box and wires come in and out and phone man comes and takes this and you get an extra line. That's a switching box, same as a router. That switching box is just sending the signal down the right line the right way, correct? Same thing. But we said let's make computer type language run across those lines, not a voice. I want to get out of the voice. So I use my phone line, I connect to my local provider who connects to this big backbone provider, somebody above them, and I'm set. And I'm on the internet, I'm good to go. I have to make this happen before I even get the World Wide Web, correct? I can't even bring up the World Wide Web. So here's how it looks in this building. If you took, for instance, I have a computer that has a local area network. Everybody connects into it. It goes to my local ISP out to the big internet. And here's my home. I can go in and connect in this way. So 
So the people at the dorms computer would come in through the home connections. Make sense? So I have a local area network that, that is local to the building, local to where I am. I have a wide area network, huge. The internet could be considered a wide area network. It a, covers a wide area. So we have a WAN and a LAN and we have a MAN. So there's a LAN, MAN, and WAN. The MAN stands for Metropolitan Area Network. So I'm covering an entire city. If I had a network that covered the city of Denver, and it was just mine, it wasn't belonging to the internet. So down here, what's the phone company down here? Um, no, not the Quest. Huh? Yeah, and then there's another one, the little company. Thank you, Blanca Telephone Company. See, he's got Blanca Telephone Company. He's got a small little network. Is it anything like the AT&T's? No, but does it connect to it? Oh, yeah. Otherwise, we don't have anything. So it's a large network of computers. That's what the Internet actually is. It is just a network of computers. It's not the World Wide Web. It's not FTP. It's not email. It's none of those things. It's a network of computers. If they're not sending signals, it's not doing anything. Okay? Similar to our phone and TV systems, uses the same stuff, satellites, all of the same communication mechanisms and methods that we use for television and those things. What's the difference? Synchronous versus asynchronous. What's a synchronous conversation? Happening at all one time versus asynchronous? I'll give you a little bit and then I'll go out of the room for a while. And then I'll come back in and say, ah, oh, here you go, I'll give you some more and then I'll leave for a while. A computer will send packets like that, just a little bit at a time, and I'll get a whole bunch of packets coming across the network and then I'll put them all back together in the order they should be and then I'll put it on the screen. But I'm gonna get all of the packets. And you could send me packet number 47 before I got packet number one. I'll just wait for number one because they could take different lines and different travel, different ways to get to me. So all I'm doing is saying, here's what I want sent, send it across, the router takes care, splits everything up, and then it comes all back together at the other end. Matches it all back up. And if you lose one of those packets as you go flying across this network, the web page doesn't come up. The email takes so long, so you hit refresh. This happens, you sit there and wait, so you hit refresh. Ah, okay. It starts spinning the next packet around, saying, okay, I'll start over again. Let me try that again, because one packet fell off the bitmap. Where'd it go? Off of one of those lines and got lost. A computer person would never make anything get lost, right? We'd never do that. Never, 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 never. So, I've said it, the World Wide Web is not the internet. It uses the internet to communicate, but it is not the internet. So when my mom comes and tells me and says, I got this problem, let me bring up the internet. Well, she's got a cable connection into her house. It's up, it's always up, it's always there. It's like, no, you know, you're bringing up the World Wide Web. I'm bringing up that component. The fo all of these are, worldwide, are internet applications. The World Wide Web uses HTML. A lot of you may want to build your own web page. HTML is how you do it. HTML stands for hypertext. Markup language. How many of you used those old, old word processors from eons ago where you had to hit the funky key and then it would bold for a while and then you'd hit another little funky key and it would take the bold away? And you'd put one on each end. So it'd say start bold and then I'd say turn off bold. 
start italicizing, turn the italicize off. Remember those old word processors? I got some of you going, yeah. That's all this hypertext markup language is. Make it bold, turn the bold off. Make it italicized, turn that off. Make it a big font. No, nah, nah, I'm done with big fonts now. That's all it does. Don't let it confuse you. We'll look at a little bit of how you can build your own and what you can do. What it uses is the hypertext protocol. That's how it's sending the data across <laughs> this network. It uses hypertext. Okay? If I use email, I use POP3 or SMTP. What does that mean? It's the protocols that I'm using on my server. The thing that you have to remember when you send or receive <coughs> email. This SMTP stands for Simple Message Text Protocol. Now, there's a real cute technical name, but if I get that name into your head, Simple me Message, Simple Message, Simple Message Text Protocol, it's text. I can put a little device called a sniffer on the lines, on any line. You know how they talk about people hearing in on your phone conversations? Because they put a little sniffer, you can put that on there, and you can catch all your internet traffic. If it's in simple message text, can I just read it as it goes across? Yes. I can just read it. I don't have to decipher it. I don't have to do any of that. All I have to do is read it. Nothing else. So if I send a credit card number across my internet, <gasps> somebody says, please give me your password via email. Well, I immediately know it's a scam. Don't give anybody your password over. I don't ever. It's going across the internet, not using the World Wide Web. It is using simple message text protocol. That's it. Doesn't matter. I can pick it all up. You don't have to retrieve your email using the World Wide Web. How many of you do? Yeah. They go, oh, I got to get onto the internet. I got to bring up the web. You don't have to. You can get your email through Outlook, Thunderbird, all of these, and I don't bring up a web page. I bring up an application that's a mail application, not a web browser application. Yeah. I tried to print a picture the other day and it said it was cached. It said we looked up the URL and I don't know what that means. It says it was cached and to look up the URL. What it's telling you is that it brought a picture in. And when we talk about cache, what does a computer person mean when they say cache? It's like, okay, no, I don't have any change in my pocket. That's not where I'm going. But what I am saying is that I am going to actually stop and say, I'm going to think for you and I'm going to think a little ahead and I'm going to save things for a while because you might want to go back there. And I'll put that in my cache and I'll set it there because you might need it. And after a while, if that gets so old and there's too much stuff, it'll I'll overlay that because obviously I was wrong and you don't need it. And all of a sudden you said, yeah, I do. We said, wow, well, wait a minute. It was here, but now it's gone. Why don't you go to back to that website for me and bring that picture back up and I'll be okay. And if you didn't bring the picture up originally, whoever put it and attached it to the email didn't fully attach it. They attached only where to get it. And that was their cache, and you can't get to their cache. <laughs> cache is not, you know, it's like, I'm not going to go play in somebody else's cache pile. I got to pay in my own cache pile. <laughs> and that's the only way I can do it. So I talk about these protocols. What does that mean, protocol? What's that word even mean? Does it, anybody know off the top of your head? line of uh, system, system line 
Yeah, I, I got it. What protocol are we talking in? English. If I was standing in, New Me in Mexico, I'd probably use Spanish. That's their protocol to speak in. Ours is English. Computer, if I'm using the World Wide Web, it's HTTP. If I'm using email, it's SMTP or POP3. If I'm using a file transfer, I want to move files across the internet. I don't want to bring up anything fancy. I just want to move files. I'm going to use the file transfer protocol. No matter what I do, I'm going to go, OK, what language do I want to talk in? How do I want to get across that network? Because I don't have to use HTTP. I can use whatever I want. Sound fair? I keep coming over here because in my classroom, my screen is a touch screen. And I can hit the screen and go to the next slide. And I go, oh, wait. So each one of them is a different language, every one of them. Protocol represents what language am I talking in? How did I configure the zeros and ones to make this? Protect your system. If I have anything to say tonight that you want to walk out of here and go, OK, I got to do that, there are two things. Make sure your virus scanners are always up to date. If you go out onto the internet, how did we get to be commercialized? Because somebody put a virus worm on the network and the military pulled back, right? Where do you get every virus on your computer? Anytime you connect to a network, you can be get a virus any single time. If I don't want to ever leave my house, I might not ever get sick. But as soon as I go out in the community, I might run into somebody and get sick. Touch grocery cart. If I keep my computer completely isolated and do not network it ever, it can never get a virus. As soon as I plug it into the internet, do I bring up the World Wide Web? No. As soon as it's plugged in, boom, I can have a virus because I plugged it in. Always make sure you have a virus scanning software. I don't care what you have. I don't care if it's AGV and it was free, or it was McAfee and that's what you love, Norton, it doesn't matter. Get one, keep it up to date. If that means you leave your computer on one night a week, leave it on, spend the money on electricity, rather than spend the money on getting your identity back. Okay? Weigh what you want to do. Always have that up to date. Always, if you use wireless at home, protect your wireless modem. If you don't know how, go look that modem up on the internet and just ask, how do I protect my modem? It's amazing. It'll come back and tell you in a heartbeat. We'll look at some searches like that tonight. It's like, it's amazing. If you just type a question, it'll come back and tell you. It'll attempt to give you an answer. The guys at Google set up the searches real good. They're real sophisticated. Do not put any of your personal information on email that you don't want given out. Don't do it. Whatever you do, don't ever give your password out. I say to people, and I lecture it in class, and I say, what's your password? And you'd be surprised how many students will just tell me. If somebody asks you, what's your password, look at them and go, I'm not going to tell you why. You know, you don't give those things out. My mom and dad have a little card, it's a recipe card holder next to the desk, and you open it up, and it has all the passwords in alphabetical order by sight. Don't do this. Do not do this. I realize that we get old and my memory goes, Get two or three that you just cycle through. And don't make them your kids' birthdays. You know, somebody said, how do you think of your passwords? I'm like, one day I was sitting at the computer. This will give you an idea of how I dream up new passwords. And I'm going, oh, that plant looks like it's dying. I need to give it some water. So my password was water the plants now with a couple of numbers after it. Well, I mean, who would guess water the plants now? <laughs> I had several numbers that I always use after it, and I had a new password for a while. 
Make it things like that that you can remember. Don't wire funds because somebody sent you an email desperately asking you for it. Unless you met that person eye to eye, had a chat with them, and know that when you sent them money it was going to be used for a valid source, and they were valid, then you can. But if you haven't met them eye to eye, I would not send money. I would not do it. Never, ever, ever send any credit card numbers, bank numbers, or other information to anyone, anyway, via email. If I'm on the internet, make sure that it's a secured site. How do I know if it's secured? Out at the bottom, there's a little key. Got a little key. Got a little lock. Any of the HTTPSs are secure. S stands for secure. Okay? If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And on this presentation, there's a uh, website. And that's a posting by the U.S. government as to different scams, different things that are happening that you might periodically want to go and look at and double check and say, oh, okay. Huh. It's got all kinds of real interesting information out there about different scams. So browsers. We know the internet is not the World Wide Web, and we believe that, so we have to talk about browsers. There were all kinds of browser wars. How many of you know there was browser wars between Microsoft and Netscape? Who won? No, it wasn't Microsoft. Microsoft lost. How many suits has Microsoft ever won that they had filed against them? None. Zero. Now, they're very good at what they do. So you have Internet, uh, Microsoft Explorer, what I call Internet Explorer, because that's what it was called years ago. It's a web browser done by Microsoft. I personally don't use it. There's Chrome, which is a fancy version of a browser done by Google that I can use. Firefox, that's what I use, is Firefox. It's done by Mozilla. Why would I choose Firefox? Why does anyone choose a browser? It's basically, why do you choose a Cadillac over a port? I don't know. You, you, you choose it because that's the one you like. The other reason I chose to use Firefox is the first person who ever built a browser and the World Wide Web page started Mozilla, and that's what Firefox is based off of, is the very first web browser. So I kind of stick with the guy who knows. They kind of, you know, I, I have faith they, they would know what they're doing. It also follows the standards the closest, meaning that those of us in the computer world, we like standards. We like things being the same all the time. So we know when data is going across the network, it's always going across the same way. It's always happening this way. This is always going to work this way. It's like talking to a physicist about the periodic table of elements. They're going to work this way, darn it. And you're not going to tell me it's not going to until something really strange happens in science, right? Then you'll go, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> OK? Same thing, I want standards so that I know everybody's following the same thing so we can all build equipment and it all can interoperate. On the World Wide Web and on the Internet, standards are very difficult to make. Very difficult. If you think, where did this whole mess start? Let's go back to the Cold War. Let's go back to the Internet starting. There's a bunch of academians getting together and playing around. And they created a system called an RFC. It's called a request for comment. Because we wouldn't want to push any standards and rough those down your throat, because we're academia people. We'd like to agree that we all agree that that would be a good thing to do, and let's do that because I wouldn't want to run anything down your throat. So there's requests for comments. 
And the entire internet is done this way. It's a bureaucracy. And it's all done with RFCs, requests for comments. Request for comment goes out there, everybody talks about it for a while, we all kind of mush it around and say, does that sound right? Is that good? Yeah, that's kind of good. Everybody feels good about it. And then it becomes a standard. But only once we feel good about it. Put that into perspective against true standards like uh, standards for quality. Ain't going to match. We kind of go, oh, yeah, well, you want to do it that way, that's okay. You can do it that way then. We're going to do it this way over here. We'll meet in the middle. <laughs> it doesn't always make for a great network, but it ends up that all of those browsers will act just slightly different. They will be tweaked just slightly different because hey, yeah, this programmer wrote it versus this one. They want it to be this way versus they want it to be this color. <coughs> I have a hard time with deciding what color a website should be. It doesn't matter to me. When we first started computing, it was all green letters and fanfold paper. It's like, you know, we didn't care. So if you keep this in mind, what browser you use really is up to you. Okay? So, how do we search on this thing? How many of you are expert searchers? Yeah, you can, make, you can find anything on it. What, what do you want to find? I'm interested in the search engine of, of Google or something like that. Yeah, but what do you want me to find? Oh, yeah. Yeah, what's the challenge? Um, it's not very challenging, type it in. Exactly. Uh, People go, what do you mean? How did you find that? Today I was asked in class. Do you, have you ever seen one of those little remote things that you can push and it'll find your keys? I said, yeah. So where? I said, well, type in Google, remote key finder. And uh, wow, remote key finders came flying up on the screen, about 40 of them. It's like, <laughs> pick a word, do a search. What words do you always leave out of a search? And or not? These things that geeks like me use, I want to find this and this. So you want to leave those kinds of words out. But we'll try an internet search here in a moment. When you do this, you want to validate your site, though. What came back on your search? As Professors here at Anna States, we harp on this so much. Wikipedia is not a valid source. People go, well, why isn't Wikipedia a valid source? What do you mean? Here's the reason Wikipedia is not a valid source. There's a little section, let's pretend, on Wikipedia about how to do brain surgery. I know nothing about brain surgery. But I can sure log on and go through it. Ah, you cut them open like this, and I could make do 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 and I could tell you everything I knew about it. It's all fictitious. Nobody's going to say I was wrong. And I post up there, boom. I didn't need anybody's permission. Do I know anything about brain surgery? Wikipedia is not a valid source. It doesn't go through any checks or balances. Nobody ever looks at it and says, who wrote that? That's silly. That's stupid. Now, if there is something, somebody will probably point it out and say, this isn't right. But the chances of you getting something that's wrong are high. So number one, we leave out Wikipedia and blogs. They're not valid sources. Look, is there a big bibliography? Does the person really say who they are? Can you check their credentials? Do you know? How do you know who I am? What do you mean she knows the internet? What's the deal? She says she's been using it since 1992. Yeah, okay, how do, you, how do you verify these things? Well, you could go back and look at my resume. Okay, can you contact them? If they don't want you to know where to contact them and to connect with them, be worried. Why don't they want me to contact them? Hmm, maybe I can't trust them. 
Whenever you go to a website, the way things work out on the internet, we need to stop and pull ourselves back and go, okay. With a phone company, you had to have an area code, right? Your area code got you to this spot, right? We don't have area codes on the internet because they're not local. It's not this server and this server are all right here. Instead, we think of it as what domain do you want to serve? Do you want to serve the commercial domain? Do you want to serve the EDU, academia domain? Do you want to talk about the government? Do you want to deal with the military? Do you want to deal with what? And that's where this standard comes from. Yes, we, gosh, we started with some standards because, you know, we wouldn't want to get too strict. Dot com, commercial, dot edu, dot gov, dot military, dot net, dot org. Dot org and dot commercial are getting mixed a lot now. There's not as many rules. Dot org used to be nonprofit. Dot com used to be truly commercial. Okay, in the past, the reason that you can't keep track of it anymore is that dot edu, when the internet first started, there was a, I don't know how the right word is, a movement to keep it within the four-year college purview. And a community college couldn't be an EDU. <laughs> so I had to register Pikes Peak Community College as a CC because it wasn't really EDU. Okay. And so we did a .org as well, but that didn't work, and they finally loosened up the .edu, and you can get it now if you're not a four-year college. Military.network, the .net is usually your internet service providers. Somebody who's providing you access to the network, therefore a .net. Make sense? If it comes across to something weird, you might want to question it and stop and go, okay. So, here we go. How many of you want a website? <coughs> Why? My first question is, what you going to put on it? Hmm. A business, see? The, the, the thing about building a website is back in the 90s when I put up the first website I did for Pikes Peak Community College and I bring up this web server and I'm happy as a lark of God, everything functioning and the college's first website comes up. And the philosophy was, and it was very true, if you build it, they'll come. Well, because there weren't very many there. It was so new. <laughs> if you were actually out there playing, there was two or three. When the World Wide Web started, it didn't have hardly anything. So if you built something, everybody would come because, wow, there was something there. It's like the television starting. There were only two channels. Well, was, since they were the only two we could watch, we sure watched them. <laughs> we didn't care if we liked the show. That wasn't the point. Now you can change channels. Now you can change the channel on the internet rather frequently. So when anybody, because lots of people from the community come and say, I want a website. Could you build me a website? Do you have students that will build me a website? How do I do this? What do I do? And my first question always is, is okay, what are you going to do with it? It's like the TV. Do we each need our own channel or our own commercial? No. Probably not, but if I have a business, I might. And then I can say, oh, okay, I got a purpose. But me personally, I don't need it. I might want one for my organization or for this. So what my next question is, is what you can put on it? Because they, people come to me and say, I want to build a website. So I say, okay, you go home. And you start in Microsoft Word, and you type what you want to be on that website. You type it out. Because I'm not going to type it. I'm going to cut and paste out of your Word document right onto a website. <laughs> I don't want to have to make stuff up for you. So 
Normally what happens is it takes people six to eight months to come back to me with what they want it to say. That's the hard part. The easy part is putting it up. That's easy. In all reality, I can show you tonight, in five minutes, how you can have a website built up on there. You can have a place for your users to log in, everything rolling, and it's perfect. And you can walk away and go, okay, that was cool. And you'll be done in a total of a half hour. But you stop dead short, and it'll take you another 25 hours just to figure out what you're going to put on it. So you may have it on the screen ready to build and ready to go, go but you're still sitting there scaring at the screen. What am I going to type? What do you want to say? So before you ever go there, what you going to say? What do you want to do? Who are you going to be talking to? This goes back to people say, how did business get a computer information systems? This is why. How do I translate my marketing to the internet? What do I want to say? How do I know this? So what I always recommend is go to the internet. Go to those sites that are similar to what you want to build. Look at those. See what they're like. See what you hate about those sites. Make some notes. Go, okay, I liked this, I liked this, didn't like this, this is ugly, that's bad. And at the end, you'll have a real good idea of what you should put, what you want it to look like, why you want it. Then you're ready to build it. And then it goes real quickly. But the next step that you have to think about is who's going to maintain it and do I have the time? And he said, well, aren't you going to start a blog? And I just looked at him. In what hour of the day am I going to sit down in front of a computer and tell the world about my day and blog about it? I'm sorry. I, I, don't, ha I, I don't have that excess time. I really don't. I'm not starting a blog anytime soon, gang, so <laughs> somebody, I, I, got, I got myself a Twitter account. And I mean, I've had this account for nearly two years. I got it while I was working on my dissertation because somebody said I needed to do this or that and had to be do this for the dissertation. So I got this Twitter account. Like 25 people are following me. I don't do anything with it. I'm looking at it going, well, I've never on it. Why are you following me? <laughs> See, when she puts this out to YouTube, they'll probably all start following me for some unknown reason. So are you going to maintain it? It's not as easy as you think. Every day, you check the email. Is this going on? Is, is it broken? Did something happen? Did you add something new? Is it functioning? Why did you add something new? It's a constant update. Now on the flip side, I get rather agitated if I have gone to a business and I need to find something later and I want to look at something up on that and business doesn't have a website. I'm frustrated. You kind of go, well, oh, where's your website? I recommend it highly. Make sure that you can maintain it. The one thing that you guys probably don't see, because we've all said in the web development groups, take it away, page under construction. Well, then don't put it out there. <laughs> it's like, okay, it's not like a road construction where I have to let you know because you're going to fall in the ditch. If it's under construction, don't put it out there. Finish it, then put it out there. Then you're not under construction. So keep those things in mind. Can you use Facebook? Can you use a blog to do the same thing? So how do we do this? You ready to build a website? You guys think I'm nuts that you can do this. What? How much time do I have left? Ten minutes? Ten minutes? We're going to do it. So here you go. Here's a website. All I did was did a search for um, free websites hosting. Because let's think about the internet. You can get to all these worldwide web pages. They're sitting out there on all these servers all throughout the world, right? You can go pull their web page off that server and it comes down to your computer. So 
All web pages have to be accessible to everybody on the internet. Is my computer always on? Is my computer going to be on to serve that page up all the time? No, it doesn't. And I don't want my machine to be the machine that's serving it up. I want that to be connected to some big pipe out there on some internet service provider's server running really fast so that when somebody picks up my web page, it doesn't take them 47 years to get out of my dial-up modem and out across the internet and out to them. You see? I don't want that. I want it to be sitting on some server someplace. So I have to have somebody host my web page. I don't host it on my computer. They host it up on their server. OK, so let's build a web page. We first need to get an account in this group, Weebly. I think that's how you say that, Weebly. So I'm going to say, let's, let's do this. And we need a password. And we need an email. Let's see. And now, I hate these little things, these little security things. You're supposed to be able to read that. And I always mess it up and think, am I that blind? Is there a dot there, or is it, huh? Yeah, G? R-I-G-A-T-I-O. A better site than I do. Oh, what's the title of our website? Give me a title. Homecoming. Easy. Huh? Homecoming. Homecoming. <laughs> Type of site. Personal. Business. Business, personal. Let's have a wedding. Oh, well, let's okay. <laughs> Homecoming for the wedding. There we go. Wow, look at this. Hmm. Now I get to create a domain. What this is saying is that, you know, you type in www.adams.edu, right? What do I want mine to be? What do I want mine? This one's the free one they give me for free because it's got their little weebly.com. So that's the free one. This one here I would have to pay for, or I already paid for one, so it's down here. And I can use that one. Now, who do I pay? This whole big consortium out there. There's a group called ICANN, I-C-A-N-N. -N. And that's the group that basically stands there and says, we're a democracy, but this is how we should do this. So we're going to try to enforce it. But we won't really throw you in jail. <laughs> but we'll, we'll get kind of angry at you. Because you always have to step back and think, the internet was started from academia, so we're pretty friendly about everything, and we don't like to get upset. Right? <laughs> if you keep that in mind. So I'm going to use our free one. Who's getting married at homecoming? I'm going to start worrying about the high school kids. How's that? Available. And it's available. It says, hey, you're, we, we know you're pretty much an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll let you have it. Go for the gusto. Why is it not clicking? What is that day homecoming waiting? Oh, yeah. yeah. What? There it goes. Oh, wow. Look at that. OK, let's first stop and say, what kind of design would we like? We, don't, we want a cool design. We don't want to be planting gardens. We want. 
What do we want for our wedding? We can have all kinds of things. Oh, here, here's where we're going on our honeymoon. There we go. Oh, isn't that just pretty? Okay. And let's go over here. We can put a paragraph in. You ready? Drop. And look, all I have to do is add our wedding is a homecoming event. <laughs> okay. I can put a picture in. How do I put a picture in? You drag and you drop it. Now I can put text. And I can say, okay, here it is. This is all fun. I want to put in a good picture. I can choose a file. Hmm. Are there any pictures out here? Samples. Hey. We got sunset. Whoa. Okay. Then I can go right here and I can add another page. I can add a blog. Or I can publish. Oh, that sounds great. Publish it. What does that mean, publish it? I want it to go out to the server and tell the world it's ready. So now we should be able to get another tab and yep. see it? Yes, we should. But we're going to go right there and we'll try it. Oh, look at that, you guys. Look at that. There it is. You thought I was kidding. You could build a web page in 10 minutes? <laughs> I, I got two minutes. <laughs> no, it's not. My husband started building his web page a couple years ago, but he taught himself HTML throughout the process. And this is the book he's currently using. And it's a fairly good book. It doesn't bury you in all kinds of technical guru. It just says, here's the tag, here's how you do it. If I recommended a book, that would be a book that I would recommend. But you can sit and play with these things and build whatever you want. I suppose you don't like it. You want to get it off the web. How do you get it off? How do I get it off of there? You go back over to this site here. And when I remove it and tell these guys here that kill my account, they'll pull it down. I have to tell these people here that I could start a blog. Does you everything. And how do I get hits? <laughs> there they are. I don't have any. I mean, I just built it. <laughs> but how does the internet know that I exist now? Uh, I, I would assume that you would attach that, your, your um, homecoming web page, to your own account and send it out to your friends or something. I don't know. Actually, yeah. it's amazing what the geeks did of the world. They said, we're going to make life a little easier than that for you. And what we did is there's a little GoBot, what we call a GoBot, it's a little robot that goes out on the internet. And it used to be called a worm, but they decided a GoBot was a better name for it. And it goes out to every web server on the internet, hits the web server, scans every page on that web server, scans them all, pulls out keywords, drops them in its search database, goes to the next one monitors if there's a new page laid out onto that server to send the GoBot there. So anything to do with the, uh, with the words that, that are associated with what you're doing? Gonna Come up homecoming. It would find, by tomorrow morning, you can find this website by doing homecoming wedding. Right. And I bet it'll come up. Yeah. And consequently, when you say you've had X number of hits, how many of those hits are Google and others that are out checking the web for new information. Those won't hit. Those don't the, show No, hits. the GoBots don't hit on your stats. Oh, okay. 
the, because the server people are, we're sitting in the background monitoring. If you ever think that we can't see every single keystroke that you send across the network, think again. I can. Every keystroke. It's frightening. I can crawl into your computer and just do whatever I want. <laughs> you just want to secure yourself. Over and over, secure it, secure, secure. Just like you keep care of your wallet. Don't let it out of your sight. And the internet is a world that is so far out of sight that you go, oh, what do I do? Because it gets out there. So we built a web page. It's like, wow, huh? At Weebly. I know, that's kind of why I picked it. It's like, okay, it's, it's a nice little site. So, there's a lot of sites like this out there. In fact, if you look at, I created this one just the other night, sitting at home. There's some pictures I took out in the San Luis Valley. I was playing with their software before I came in here. My husband is using a free, another free site, and his site, we are, is this right, site? Dot net? Um, what we're trying to do is this site, the difference is, is the free sites out there, is that you need to be just careful about one little thing. I can have a free site. Do I have any control? Can I run JavaScript? Can I run an e-commerce store on their server without paying them? Is, what's the answer to that? If that's where you want to go, you don't want an e-commerce store, then you don't even have to worry about it. But if that's where I want to be, the reason I chose this site is because I can run PHP, SQL, MySQL, I can run all kinds of weird things on the server site that he'll want. Not today, but he'll want it, okay? And so this is his site that he's been working on for quite a while. And he wants input. Is it any good? Now, you just built the site, and, and then why is, why is he working on this for about two years? Because, um, John and I met, he was the uh, uh, director to a IT department mm -hmm. back in 90, yeah, something, long time ago, and didn't use the web, but he managed a bunch of programmers, was a programmer from eons ago, worked on old machines, and when we got together, I stayed in, he became an artist, I stayed in the field, and he won't let all the fancy software do what he used to do by hand. So he has to know. <laughs> he has to do it. He likes to write the code. He likes to, see, he wants to write the code. He wants to know that he knows that. And it, does he need to? No. Unless he wants. He's wanted to do it for the last two years, so I just sit back and say, go for it. <laughs> I don't care. But yeah, uh, I believe they are in here. There's one of the birds. That's the bird that's in my office. And oh, they got these little guys and these guys. These are bronze. But that's beside the point. That's just a website. But you now can do them. But one of the last things in my presentation that I was going to tell you all, if you want me to come back and talk about this particular topic, you want more on this topic, that topic, let me know. I can do that for you. We'll see what your students do. On your college page. Oh, my college page? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get to it. 
Okay. They have changed it slightly. Um, All right. Yeah, I forgot it. I knew I was forgetting something. Just changed a little. He was in one of my web design classes, so he's earned most of this. Now I get no. Any question? Just one question. I'm sorry. Oh, your parents thinking when they came to your first thing? Hey, they weren't. <laughs> he came in late? Oh, I'm a junior. My mother's name is Comfort Cover. Oh. I'm named after my mother. Yes, sir. Two questions. Uh, can you speak to encryption? And recently there's been discussion about the RFID chips on credit cards and things and the protection for those since people now can walk by you and suck that information off. They can suck it right up your card. Um, the encryption on the internet, if you use a credit card on the internet, here's my, what my tell everybody that uses the internet to buy things. Do I buy things on the internet? Yes. That means I need a credit card to use on the internet. There's one credit card I use. I don't put a lot of money in there. It's not connected to any of my other bank accounts. It can't get to anything else. That one account is the only account that's ever used on the internet, ever. Can Never ever will I put anything else on there. Can they get information of you off of that credit card uh, because of your name? And they can. And go right into your other no, they can't get into my other account. Because they're not on the internet. That's right. They're not on the, and this one's not really on the internet either. It's just that you can access it through this debit card account. With the encryption that they're talking about when they can walk by you and scan and pick up your credit card information and they can pickpocket you, normally in the state of Colorado, it's worse than other states. On your credit card, there's a little, um, looks like a mic type thing. It looks like a little modem that's doing transmissions of airways. If your card has one of those on it, then it can just be laid up against something and read. If it doesn't, it has to go through a scanner. If I use my credit card on the internet, I always want it to say VeriSign or one of the companies like VeriSign because they're doing the deep encryption. They are truly doing a public private key encryption that you need a certificate with and so forth so that it's real difficult to hack into that encryption. But here's the deal, if I really want to steal it, I can. They used to say uh, a man with a briefcase can steal more than a man with a gun. I'll switch that a man with a computer can steal more than either of them together. I can take whatever I really want. So those scanner ones aren't going to get it unless your card is set up to allow it to just be scanned, not read this way. So I'm real careful about encryption, and I make sure that the site I'm trying to buy something from does encrypt it. I also use PayPal because I can put money into PayPal, not attach it to anything. I can put money there and buy things. So it works good. Yes, sir. Uh, I saw a catalog where they had a, uh, a little machine by your computer, and you put your card through, and it does an encryption, I guess, on it, and then it says it's safer. Now, what do you have to say about that? I wouldn't buy it. It's not necessarily a scam, but it's like, okay, what are they really selling you? I really want to know how they're encrypting it, because if they encrypt it so much that I can't use the card anymore, I'd be wondering what you're doing to my card. I have a tendency to keep <coughs> one credit card, besides the fact he won't let me have any more, but <laughs> um, I keep that one card and that's it. And you can 
get yourself in trouble with a credit card in more ways than one. Because if you hand somebody a credit card in a restaurant and they go back and they scan it, they could have scanned it twice and taken everything that you were worth right there. So is it any different on the internet? Yeah, because they have to do it electronically and they have to have a lot more skill than I needed in a restaurant to go <laughs> twice, you see? So I don't worry about it as much as some technical people. I would say I wouldn't spend my money. I'd save it. Yes, sir? Uh, a revision on the encryption. There used to be software that would allow you to encrypt emails, pic pictures, files. Uh, are those still of value? Yes, but I just wouldn't send that stuff via email. If, I, if it needed to be encrypted before I sent it, if it was secure, I would not send it via email. I would send it file to transfer. secure file transfer protocol so that I knew it was secure. If it needs to stay secure, I wouldn't use email. That's why I explain SMTP as simple message text. <laughs> If you e-fax something, is that any safer than doing it over the email? No. E-faxes, just put an attachment next to the email and ship it across. So it's like, okay. And so the next question is, is what about the government and my taxes when I electronically file? Well, I do it. But security on the internet. You have to stop and think, what are the geeks going to do? And if you know what the geeks are going to do, if you think like a geek, you might know. So people say to me always, well, why don't I hear about, you guys talk about this thing called Unix. And there's not as many Macs out there as there is this. Linux and Unix run on and the Mac platform all run on Unix operating system. So the underneath ground talking to the architecture is Unix. Linux is a version of Unix. It's freeware. It's free. I mean, not just free, 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 free. I'll even give you the source code. And if you want to change it, go for the gusto. It's free. Here. The only thing you got to pay for is if you want to put it on a CD and you don't want to download it because you don't want to wait. Okay, it's free. Now you got Microsoft. <laughs> okay, now I've got an operating system. Is it free? Can I get the source code? Who's going to be more fun to break if I'm a geek wanting to break something? The one I get the source code for free? and it's handed to me, or the one that I have to figure it out. Which one am I going to pick? Doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out. I'm not going with the free stuff. I'm going to try and hack into the stuff that's going to take me a little more work. Makes sense? Now, there are viruses on the Unix and Mac side, but they're not as prevalent because you can't build them. And I think I'm going to get cut off here. Any other questions before? Yes? Um, the, they say that the addresses are running out and that it won't really be a concern until we, you know, we have websites and then other people will be handling things. So what, what do we need to be concerned about if we are setting up like more of a, a website that might take us some time to do? Not a thing. Nothing. Not a thing. Are the addresses running out? Yes. But no, because at Adam State, we have a Class C address to take care of this entire complex, everybody. Well, there's not enough internet addresses so that everybody can talk all at the same time. So we say, well, that's not going to work. And then we say, well, OK, let's fake out the internet. Everybody on this side of this router we're just going to give you a fictitious number. We don't care if it's real or not. But we know what it is on this side. Everybody out there, 
We all have one number. Nobody has the same. And when it comes into the router, the router says, oh, really, you want you. Oh, OK, I'll send it to you. So everybody behind that router doesn't really have an IP address, doesn't really have anything the internet's concerned about. The internet never sees it. So when they say we're going to run out, yes, we will. But they're already fixing that and bringing up version 5 numbers. All of the will be converted and done. You won't even see it as the general consumer. It's like an uh, area code. Well, OK, we got a new area code. So now mom lives in 303 instead of 3. OK. It won't even be that major. You won't even see it. Maybe one more question. Okay. Uh, if you buy a new computer now and you um, try to use Windows Media, then before you can use it, you have to uh, get permission. And then it says Microsoft's going to come and look at where you're going, what you're doing, because their story is they want to do it better and they want to know what you're doing. So, uh, so when you use that player, then people are looking at it. So what, what's that going to do? Um, the book 1984 comes to mind, but that's all right. Um, it's, it's not going to do a lot. The thing is, is that it's no different than if I said, I'm going to, how do I know what radio stations are you turning into? Well, I don't, but I do, I could kind of track it. Maybe I could, maybe I couldn't. Okay. And what am I going to do with that information? If I'm a marketer, I love it. I know what you like. I know how old you are. I know what, you know, you need this, you need that. And from your perspective, at times, it is nice. They know who I am. They know that I have to wear glasses. I know da 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 They know this about me, and they, I don't have to worry about it. And I can go through it. Do I ever want them to know information about me that I don't want them? No. So that's when I keep that off of that. It's like, okay, it's a music player. You're going to listen to what music I like? Okay, great. Yeah, I don't like that and I don't like rap, but some people love rap, so great. <laughs> Track all you want. So I look at what the tracking is for and then I go, well, okay. And I forget about it most of the time because they are watching you all the time. Any purchase over $500 is tracked by the U.S. government electronically. Unless it's a cash deal. Did you guys know that? Any, any purchase, anything over $500 is tracked by the U.S. government. Electronic, like everything. If you spend over $500 or more, it's tracked. Now, did they ever look at it? Mm, not really, but maybe if there was like something that started happening, a whole bunch on this one person, a terrorist that was just caught. Mm. How'd they know what he was spending money on? Spent more than 500 bucks. Well, thank you all for coming. Let's thank our speaker. Adam State College. Great stories begin here.